Good morning, church. I just couldn't help but... Well, I, I know it wasn't me. I know the Holy Spirit was showing me. Because, uh, you know, I don't know how your week's been this week. I uh, pray that it's been a great week, a blessed week. Uh, but as Michelle said, you know, sometimes that breaking, it ain't, it ain't too... It ain't too graceful. And uh, in order for us to be, you know, built up in the Lord, uh, there's no way around it, but there there needs to be a sledgehammer taken to us that breaking, right? Or, uh, you know, you take the analogy of uh, a sacrifice on the altar. The sacrifice has to be immersed in fire, for it to become pure in order for it to be uh, acceptable to the Lord. And in that burning away of all those impurities in that offering, you know, all the bad stuff goes away. Like when you put, you know, a, a metal in the fire and all the sludge and all those impurities in that, in, that, in that stone or whatever come out. And what's left is, you know, the person who puts it in can see the blacksmith or whatever can see uh, his reflection in that in that item and that's the same thing with us and so you know i know i've been feeling that this week uh even even in uh how can i say i was talking to daniel about this you know before we came out here and we we're praying even in the honorable things and the noble things of the lord there, there has to be a there has to be a balance right and, and, and we can't, uh, many, many uh, pastors or, or many uh, of people that serve in ministry will use the excuse of doing things for the Lord, but then they neglect the people closest to them. And so, you know, I pray that that's just not the case in our lives. But in that, there's always correction. There's always uh, keeping us on the right track. And in those instances, we just have to be honest with ourselves and honest with the Lord and and say, all right, Lord, am I, am I on track with what you want me to do? Or am I kind of veering off even in your namesake? And so um, I've been dealing with a little bit of that this week. But in all things, again, God is good and he's gracious. And aren't you so glad that he, he grades based on what Christ has done? He doesn't grade based on what your performance is and what my performance is or what you produce and what I produce, right? It's all about what Christ has done. And so it's a that's a great reminder to us to stick close to him in all the instances of life. Uh, excited this morning. We, we've, it seems now like we've just been blowing through the book of Revelation. I don't know. I don't know how much time. I don't know when we started this book. Daniel knows. <laughs> Go ahead. Give, give me a date because I, I don't I mean, I don't I have this have this stuff in my notes, but I know today is Sunday, October 16th. Back in August 15th. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And everybody told me, <laughs> Revelation, man, you're going to spend a lot of time. Maybe, I don't know if I'm just blowing through it, but. Oh, um, August 15th of last year. That's yeah. what I meant. Okay. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, man, August, man, everyone's going to get out of here. They're like, this is not the right church for me. <laughs> uh, in any event, uh, we're starting Revelation chapter 21 this morning. Uh, great, great chapter, great portion of scripture. Uh, it's entitled The New Heaven and the New Earth. Uh, so when you get there, uh, if you can, please stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, once again, we'll be in Revelation chapter 21. We'll be going through verses 1 through 8 this morning. And it reads, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. 
And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Verse 7, the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we, we just come before you, Lord, and as we read those words, uh, Lord, I, I just pray that it would hum, humble us, Lord, that we would have a humility about our hearts as we search through these scriptures, Lord, and, and, and we ask the question, Lord, of, of where are we, Lord? Where are we in this, Lord? May we not be deceived into thinking that we are automatically just drawn in, Lord, but May we know that there's plenty of evidence that suggests that we are saved, Lord. And may it never be uh, a comfortable thing for us to tell people uh, about hell in the sense of it, it should break our hearts, Lord, that people are going to go to hell. It should break our hearts that there is a place that was prepared for Satan and his demons. And yet people who refuse to surrender and submit to you, that's where they're headed, Lord. So may you give us a heart like Jesus's that would go out to uh, the byways and the highways and the, the alleys of this life. And may we reach out to those that are in desperate need of grace and mercy. And Lord, would you show us exactly what your scripture says this morning? May we uh, leave here knowing you more and knowing the purpose that Jesus has for us while we live on this earth. So again, Father, we thank you and we love you. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. All right. Uh, like I said, today we're beginning a new chapter in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21. Last week we ended chapter 20, which talked about the great white throne judgment. All who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord in this life which is the only life to receive him, <laughs> the present life we live in, all those will be forced to stand judgment before him in the next life. That's it. There's, there's, there's no way around it. Uh, there's no wiggle room, if you will. Um, everyone is held accountable for what they do in this life. Everyone is held accountable for who they say Christ is in their lives and whether or not they receive him or not. Uh, the verdict will be in. Again, all that awaits those who have rejected Christ in this life will be when they die, they're going to wait to be sentenced, right? There, there is, you can't appeal. <laughs> There's no appeal. Uh, you can't get Johnny Crocker in. You can't hire a, a, a good uh, defense attorney. It's, it's it. <laughs> the, 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 the letter has been uh, brought in and the judge has is, is already slammed the mallet. That's what's going on. Um, as we transition from uh, chapter 20 into chapter 21, we will see a great shift. Um, and this is going to bring a lot of joy to us because uh, it, it's good that we've had a lot of warning and we see the other side. But now this is uh, what, what blessings uh, are awaiting those who have trusted in Christ with their life, who have trusted in him for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, for redemption. Right. Again, we just talked about it. Uh, we have we hold no merit to God based on what we do. When we go before God, if we say anything else other than it's because of your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for my sins, he's going to reject us. Uh, he, don't matter. Oh, I, I, my family was in ministry for 50 years. That ain't going to cut it. Uh, I was the pastor. I was the worship leader. I, I fed homeless people. I did this. I did that. that none of those things are going to cut it. Now, those may be things that don't burn up. They might be good works, but that's not what gets us into a right standing with God the Father. That's not what gives us access into heaven. It's just, I'm a wretched sinner. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin, rose again for, uh, on the third day, and now he's seated in heaven. It's because of what he did. It's because of his blood shed for me. It's because of his righteousness, his redemption, his mercy, and his grace all alone. Now, if we can honestly, confidently say that, 
without wavering. That is what's going to give us access to the Trinity, the triune God forever and eternity and the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth. That alone. From eternal death to eternal life in Jesus Christ, we'll have fellowship with him forever and eternity. And that, that's where we want to focus our attention this morning in the beginning of this chapter 21. We have several main points. And the first one is this. One day, I don't know, nobody knows. They've, people have published so many books about it. When's Jesus coming back? Don't even just get that out of your mind. I, I, I just want to remind you this before I even say this point. This is so important. If we live a lifestyle that is in line with Christ, if we submit our lives wholeheartedly, right, as much as we possibly can being led by the Holy Spirit, I know we're going to, you know, we're going to stumble. But what I'm saying is if we're living a life of continuity in Christ, right, it ain't going to matter if you see the end of the world and all these things coming about. As we can see these things already progressively happening. You're not going to start looking through books and trying to figure out what. You're going to be that much more compelled to live for the Lord, to obey him, to love him, to love people, to carry out the mission and the purpose that he's called you to do individually as a believer and corporately as a part of the body of Christ. That is the truth. Running around frantic with your head cut off like a chicken because of all these different things that are happening is not what the Lord called us to do. He calls us to occupy this life. What does that mean? That means to be engaged and involved in what the work he calls us to do in spiritual warfare, in the good fight of Jesus Christ, fighting the good fight of faith, right? So it's not going to matter. Yes, you'll see these things, but you're not going to be moved or shaken because as it's been said before, your spiritual bags are packed. You're ready. In an instant, you're, you're, you're not even tripping because you're like, it's, it's all good. When I go, I go. When this earth burns away, it's going to burn away. But I already know I got my ticket. I got my one-way pass to heaven. I got my one-way ticket. And when it's time, it's time. But until then, I'm going to be about my father's business. I see too many people so enamored with the end times and this and that, that we get caught up in all this talk. But it's like people are dying. People are going to hell. While we're over here contemplating this and that and the third, it's like, that's not what it's about, right? And I'm constantly reminded about that, to stay on the straight and narrow path. Once again, noble good things can still be the wrong thing in the wrong context, in the wrong place, if we're not careful. We start leaning on our own understanding instead of what the Holy Spirit is guiding us to do. And we get all caught up in a bunch of stuff that is meaningless and worthless, as the Bible says talking about genealogies and all kind of other things that, yeah, it's cool for understanding purposes. But at the end of the day, if the scripture says nobody knows only the father, that's exactly what it means. It doesn't mean I'll never know when the end times going to come. And I've always, I believe the Lord has always shown me this for a long time. The end of days has come for everyone who's already died. <laughs> when you're gone, you're gone. And that's your end time, you know? Now, if we live to see it, then we live to see it. If we live to get raptured and we're out of here, then it is what it is. But if I have a heart attack, you know, eating a cheeseburger later on this afternoon, then that's my end time. And that's it. I mean, that, it's raw, but that's the reality. So may we be wise in how we spend our time and not fixate on things that we have no control over, but may we be engaged in, in the things that we can control. Amen? With that, the first main point is this. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. This world that we know will pass away. The evidence of this reality is all throughout Scripture and all around us in the world today. It's, 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 it's plain to see that this is not it for eternity. It's not. The fact that I got this fun fact earlier this morning. In America alone, and there's nothing against animal lovers, nothing against animal lovers. I, I enjoy animals. I think they're, they're beautiful creatures. I enjoy dogs. I'm not a cat person. But uh, in any event, America, and I get it, we're a big country, so take what I say w w with a grain of salt, but it's the truth. In America alone, we spend more on animal food 
then the country of Uganda has a budget. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. We spend more on animal food than a country has just to feed themselves. Humans feed themselves. So just right there, that should already just be a tipping point where it's like, okay, this, is, this doesn't add up. This life is not it. This life is not, you know, it's all just what it's supposed to be. No, there, this world will pass away. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. We just need to stop and take the time to see things for what they truly are worth and what they are. And it, it, the, the Holy Spirit will show us and it'll click. Like, I get it. Yeah, there, there's more to this life. This is not, this is not it. There's so much more. I was, I was created for so much more than this. Go back to the days of Noah. We were just talking about this earlier too. The flood, the rainbow, God's war bow, Right? It's not pointing down. The rainbow is pointed up where? Towards the third heaven, right? To where God dwells. Hung, his war bow is hung up in the sky. This was a reminder to tell humanity that he's never going to destroy the earth by what again? Water. He's never going to do it again with water. It's so interesting because for every skeptic out there that says the flood never happened. Now, mind you, it's crazy. You have mainstream, mainline Christian churches in America. Some of them teach their non-believing, you know, congregation, those that are not Savior, that they say, you don't have to believe in the account of Noah. What? What do you mean you don't have to believe in the account of Noah? If you take into question the account of Noah, then you're taking into question the sovereignty of God himself by saying it, doesn't ha it didn't happen. All you have to do is go do some research. The rings that are all around uh, the, the, uh, the Grand Canyon is evidence of the flood. There's so much evidence, but we don't even need evidence. The fact of the matter is these skeptics out there, they, they, they can maybe explain uh, the scientific reasoning for why a rainbow comes about. But <laughs> they can't explain why it's there truly or who put it there they can't they can't tell you it's true meaning they can't tell you what it's really about instead we have people groups that use that rainbow they've made it into a flag and they've totally distorted what the rainbow represents but isn't that just what satan loves to do he likes to take a righteous thing and make it try to make it wretched and people that don't know they run around town parading like they know what's going on, but they make a mockery of what God has made righteous and right. Again, this is just another sign that this earth will one day pass away. The Apostle John saw a vision of a new heaven and a new earth replacing the millennial heaven and earth. This is very important for us to understand before we move on. Okay, The heavens here, in quote, refers to that we're referring to does not refer to the heaven where God dwells, okay? There's a third heaven, <laughs> and that, that's where God dwells. This is not what uh, the scripture is talking about here, excuse me. The word translated as heaven most likely refers to earth's atmosphere or space, if you will. John writes that the first heaven and the first earth pass away, a statement that some Bible scholars interpret as a complete annihilation. I believe that to be true. I believe it's a complete annihilation. I don't believe it's a, a, a renovation, if you will. But some of those people that believe the renovation, they're going back again to Noah's time when God said, I'm going to you know, basically rid the earth of inhabitants and I'm going to repopulate the earth through the family of Noah. You can read about that uh, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Another word for new is neos, meaning a new time or new in time, if you will. And in this new heaven and new earth, there will be no sea. 
there will be no sea. The absence of a sea assures us that this does not refer to the millennial earth because during the millennium, large bodies of water will still exist. If you're not familiar, if you forget, remember Jesus comes back for a thousand year period. That's where if we live to that time and we're raptured, caught up, as uh, the, the scripture says, we'll come back, we'll reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's the millennial reign. During that time, there'll still be large bodies of water. But in regards to the new heaven and the new earth, there is going to be no large bodies of water like Atlantic, Pacific, Black Sea, all that. That's going to be gone. Okay, so this must describe the eternal earth, meaning forever earth, right? The new heaven and the new earth. That's the first main point is that this earth will one day pass away. The second main point is this. This is a beautiful point. <laughs> it, brings tear, it brings joy, excuse me, to everyone when we hear this and when we understand its implications. The Lord God will dwell with his people and wipe away every tear. There will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. Oh, that is, that is such a great guarantee. That is such a great promise, something to look forward to. Like I said, I don't know what your week has been like. I don't know if you've shed many tears or you've shed none, but I guarantee you, you've either shed tears, you've felt pain, you've experienced sorrow, and unfortunately, maybe you've even experienced death in your life. Uh, with a loved one close to you, some way, somehow, all one of those or all those things <laughs> wrap their tentacles around you this week because that's the nature of living in a fallen world. Remember, in the old Jerusalem, God dwelt in the temple, in the holy of holies. And the high priest, what? He had to make atonement for his own sins and he could only go into the holy of holies one time a year. Then when Jesus resurrected from the dead or once he died and, and and all that happened when it was finished what happened there was a great earthquake and what happened the veil was torn the veil torn meaning symbolizing now there is unhindered access between god and man now you don't need a priest to to go before you you don't need to go into a dark room and confess those things to someone you don't even know you can go straight to god and say, Lord, this is where I'm at. I need help. You can throw yourself on the mercy seat of Christ and he will hear you. He will forgive you wholeheartedly. He is your intercessor. He is your high priest. No longer a man. That's such a beautiful thing. You don't want a flawed person like me <laughs> to, be, to be the intercession between you and God. You want <laughs> the holy and righteous son of God to be that high priest for you because then you don't have to worry about someone who's flawed not getting it right he's going to get it right every time all the more reason for us not to hide like adam and eve when we fall short but run quickly to god and and keep short accounts with him and get right with him and get right with others so we can be back on track unhindered in our relationship with him amen the Apostle John heard a loud voice from the throne proclaiming, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. The saints who are God's people, that is us, that is the Jews, that is the remnant Jews, that is the remnant church. I'm not going to teach on it this morning, but again, we cannot be deceived. Not every Jew will be saved. Not everyone who professes Christ as Savior will be saved. Because even though it is a profession, it's... Belief and obedience go hand in hand. So even though there's a large group that says they're the church, there's a remnant that's the true church. And everything else is just, again, falsifying things. That's what Satan loves to do. Little, It's like a hostess cupcake, right? I mean, well, actually, hostess cupcake is just pretty much all junk. I don't know what a good analogy is for a food that's like a little bit of nutrition and just a whole lot of sugar and fat and all kind of stuff. <laughs> there you go. But that's what Satan loves to do. Little bit of truth, a gang of just trash. And, and, and if we're not like the Bereans in our, in our word, in our word, in the Lord's word daily, we're not going to be able to decipher and discern, man, this is right. This is wrong. We're going to get thrown for a loop. Some people, they just forsake the faith because they get stressed out over it. They don't know what to do. And that can't be us. So we, we want to make sure that we're, we're on point with this. 
And, and, and again, the saints, God's people, when this time comes, we will enjoy close fellowship with God unlike we've ever experienced before. This is just, just, a, just a small cap size experiencing what real fellowship, true fellowship, unhindered fellowship apart from sin and death is going to be like in heaven with God. The fellowship will resemble the experience Adam and Eve enjoyed with God in the Garden of Eden before they fell into sin. And sometimes people ask the question like, well, what happens to those who become believers during the millennium? That's a good question. Uh, Will they have glorified bodies in eternity? This is what I understand as scripture says. Likely God will remove millennial believers from the earth before he actually destroys it, right? And, 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 or and, or if, for lack of better words, renovates it. And, and they return to the new earth in a glorified body. During the millennium, the unglorified believers still have the long-lasting promise that the pure in heart will see God. That's from Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. The new Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, excuse me, they will enjoy the fulfillment of that promise. I, I love this verse, so I'll just read it. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you want to see God? If you want to see God, your heart needs to be pure. How does your heart become pure? You got to become a living sacrifice on the altar. We just talked about it. We just sang about that. That's what rattled me and shook me because it's like, yeah, it's like I'm reminded like I got to daily be burned up because there's all kind of junk in my heart and my heart needs to be purified. Our hearts need to be purified. If we allow the Lord to do that internal work that only he can do as the potter does to the clay, mold it and shape it. And sometimes that shaping hurts, as has been said. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's painful. But we will produce a harvest tenfold of righteous things that are are a blessing to the Lord and to other people. But we have to be burned up first. That that, that, that selfishness, that greed, uh, that envy, whatever it is, right, that we struggle with, that has to be burnt up within us. And it has to be brought to the altar of Jesus Christ. You can do it in your home. You can do it in your seat. It's just something that we have to consciously do. We have to be willing to allow the Lord to do that interior work that only he can do. Right? Don't be like Adam and Eve. He already knows. Right? He already knows. He's waiting for us to come forth and divulge this information. And say, Lord, man, I'm not, I haven't been living the way I'm supposed to be living. And I'm broken inside because I know I can't do it. I've been doing it in my own strength and it doesn't work. Lord, renew my heart. Give me a new heart. Clean my heart. Give me a new mind. Renew me. Make me right in your sight. It's that kind of honesty with the Lord that he answers. But if we're unwilling, and the worst thing is when we're unwilling in private. I'm not telling you to do it before people, but it is good. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another. But when we're alone with God, we cannot act as if we've got it all together. If we, if we are humble ourselves, he will, he's righteous and just to forgive us all, of all sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. But that's how we see God. And then you get a clear perspective. You get a clear view of him you won't be fogged by the sin and the deception right because satan loves to compound all that too and then he and it makes it worse because you're already dealing with shame you're already dealing with guilt and then the enemy comes in and says yeah fool you suck yeah fool, you messed up oh you screwed that up big time oh you're in the doghouse man gotta get gotta get on that line with the lord right and and and, and you can get freed from it because remember he comes to kill and destroy He wants to render you and I useless in this walk, in this life. He's like, I can't do nothing about your salvation, but I can make you useless if you let me. Again, we must remember, what do we allow ourselves to come into agreement with? Do not allow yourself to come into the agreement with the lies of Satan. Because they will will wreck your life and you will be a miserable Christian if you allow yourself to come into agreement with his lies. Mature Christians, they all know, we all know that, that, that life brings tribulation, trouble, as well as blessing and comfort. We're not deceived. We know that it's, it's a difficult life that we live in this earth. 
Pain and sorrow are inevitable in this life. I wish there was a way around it. I wish there was a way where I just was watching a VeggieTales thing with my kids this morning and like the, the, the whatever, I don't know, whatever, the asparagus and the, whatever, the radish, they're all that's singing this song. They want to be happy. And uh, what makes you happy when I have c- cookies? Well, when I have a new bike, when I have the comic book series that I want. And then the teacher says, well, what happens when you're done eating the cookie? The, the, the asparagus is like, I, I need another cookie. <laughs> and then uh, it says to the, the other uh, vegetable, what happens when, when the bike gets old? Oh, well, when it gets old, it, maybe it's broken. I need a new bike. And then, you know, the comic book went, oh, well, I want the next series. And, and, and she's trying to explain to them, you know, that's how happiness works. We always need, 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 need. We want, we want, we want. Our wants are never fulfilled, so we're only happy for a little bit of time. Where joy is completely different. You don't need everything. But see, that's where the deception comes in. I think that's where we struggle. I know that's where I struggle for sure. It's like I have these desires, and I'm like, man, if I could just get these desires met. And they're they're good desires. They're godly desires. But it's like you're not going to get everything you want in this life. But that shouldn't determine your level of happiness or your joy for a better lack of a better word, right? It, it, like being happy is like, well, I need ev- all these things to be filled. My bucket needs to be filled and I'm happy. But when you have joy, it's like your bucket could be like, man, I really didn't get anything I wanted. <laughs> but Lord, you're giving me joy because I, I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting that there's more to life than me just me just pleasing my, 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 my carnal desires, or, 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 or the things that I, I want, even though they're, they're, they're good things, he's not going to give every single stinking thing that you want. He's just not. Like, you might want that, you might want that, 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 that purple rain Corvette. <laughs> You're not going to get it, most likely, especially if there's other things that need to be paid for and need to be done. But that shouldn't determine, that Corvette should not determine your level of joy, Right? But in Christ, it's like, okay, I I didn't get everything I wanted, but Lord, I got you. The most important thing, I have a right relationship with you. And that should that should supersede any material, emotional desire or need we think we have. It's just having a right relationship with God and basing our lives on that. Again, it's just all a matter of perspective. Many times our our, our vision is just kind of we just need to tweak it a little bit. Maybe a little bit more towards one o'clock and then we're good, you know, but that's just how it is. Remember Job, even a righteous man in God's sight, he experienced personal pain and sorrow. Even so, he kept his faith on the Lord and the assurance that he would ultimately be resurrected and would see his redeemer on earth. We, too, are to look beyond our suffering and sorrow to the eternal day when what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. In the New Jerusalem, there will be no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Pain, sorrow, mourning, the passing of friends and loved ones are harsh realities in this life. But they will be over once and for all when we take up residence in the New Jerusalem. No wonder why the Apostle Paul regarded death as gain in Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. For to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. That's that he understood. He understood the perspective of an eternal look, an eternal view in light of this life. Revelation chapter 20 describes a total and complete defeat of all sin and evil. This describes the reality which comes about when God has rendered his judgment. All wrongs are made right. All sin is separated and all suffering of all kinds are gone. And the third main point this morning is this. We will either take part in the Lord's heritage or be engulfed in the second death. There's no wiggle room here. It's one or the other. You can't have both. You can't be immersed in this life and in the flesh and serve the Lord and think that eternal life awaits you with Jesus Christ in heaven. Those who thirst for spiritual satisfaction find that Jesus gives without charge. His grace saves and satisfies the thirsty soul. John chapter 14, or excuse me, verse chapter 4, verse 14 says, The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is a beautiful thing that Jesus promises those who thirst after righteousness. Also, the fourth beatitude promises that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. That's in Matthew 5, verse 6. 
That promise is fulfilled entirely and completely in eternity. All who are who will receive the gift of salvation will be included in this heritage. That's the heritage you and I are a part of and get to look forward to. All right, let's go ahead and look at these verses. So let's look at verse one. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first of for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. So again, this is a vision that John the Apostle is seeing. And when we look at the book of Revelation, if we look at chapter 21, it kind of begins again like a new section in the book of Revelation. If you want to kind of break these sections down. So Jesus, the Lord of the churches, you can look at that from Revelation chapter one all the way through uh, chapter three. Then Jesus as the lion over the nations. You can look at that from Revelation chapter four all the way to Revelation chapter 20. Then Jesus, the lamb amongst believers, that is where we're at, Revelation chapter 21, on to Revelation chapter 22. The new perspective of this last section is glorious, the fact that God's glory is shining through in this. Think of it this way. This life, right, that we're living in now, it's like a fire. There's heat, there's smoke, there's debris everywhere, there's chaos, there's pain, there's loss. That's this life, right? But in the new heaven, in the new earth, They are like a fresh breath of air, if you will, where there is no fire. It's clear, it's fresh, it's new, it's vibrant, it's refreshing, it's clean. There's a total contrast between the life to come for the believer and the life now. I'm not saying that we don't experience glimpses of those refreshing, new, fresh things here in this earth, but it's just, it's all riddled through thistles and thorns of of sin and, and, and all that sin produces so it's a difficult thing it's a difficult dance that we 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 dance in this life because you experience the grace of god and 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 the mercies of god through many hardships right and i think that's what sours some people they just they're just it's just too difficult and they give up because they're like it's just too hard but the true believer will hold on once again where is your joy if your joy is resting in christ it doesn't matter what you walk through you're going to be okay. You're going to make it because your focus and your trust and your hope is in him alone, not your circumstances where the thorns and thistles and difficulties of this life tend to choke out your joy if you're not uh, resting in him alone. A new heaven and a new earth. The idea of a new earth was with a new atmosphere and sky is a familiar theme in scripture. Many of the Prophets, both Old and New Testament prophets, spoke of this new heaven and new earth. Uh, for the sake of context, i got to read these scriptures. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 and 18. For behold, I create a, a new heavens and, and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. In Psalm 102 verses 25 down through 27 it says of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands they will perish but you will remain they will all wear out like a garment you will change them like a robe and they will pass away but you are the same and your years have no end and then second peter chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 it says waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Again, just to be clear, it's worth pointing out that this new heaven refer, that we're referring to is not where God is enthroned. The Bible uses the word heaven in three senses. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere, the blue sky that we see. The second heaven is outer space, the night sky. And the third heaven is the place where God lives in glory. When the scriptures speak of a new heaven, they mean a new blue sky, a new night sky, not a new heaven where God dwells. This is truly a new heaven and a new earth, not merely a remade heaven and earth. Again, it's not a a renovation or restoration it's a complete annihilation and it's just going to be a new completely new thing we would know this because jesus said in luke chapter 21 verse 33 that heaven and earth shall pass away but his word would live forever also in isaiah 
chapter 65, verse 17, God said prophetically that he will create a new heaven and earth. And the ancient Hebrew word for create, bara, means to create out of nothing instead of refashioning something that's, in, it ex, something that's existing already. There is a genuine physical transformation in mind. There was no more sea. That's the next uh, portion that we see here. To the Jewish people, right, in their heritage, they believed that the sea was a place separate for evil. Already in the book of Revelation, it shows to be the source of the sea. It shows to be the source of, of satanic action, interactions going on. The beast coming out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, and the place of the dead, Revelation 20, verse 13. Other passages of scripture show the sea associated with the heathen. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 20 tells us, But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. All right, so we see that just in verse 1. Let's move on to verses 2 and 4. And they read, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Okay, so the holy city, the new Jerusalem, this is the Jerusalem of hope. It's not what we see right now, it's what it will be in the future. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 tells us, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gatherings. The Jerusalem above. Galatians chapter 4 talks about this in, in uh, chapter 4 verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. And then a place of real citizen citizenship real uh people living amongst each other philippians chapter 3 verse 20 tells us but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior the lord jesus christ so we have to look at these two terms holy and new okay holy and new they they distinguish they they separate this city from anything that has been ever, ever been seen before because it is holy and new, it is different from an earthly city. I was thinking, when I was doing the study, I think of New York. I'm like, roaches, rats, crime, infestation, gutters with sewage. I mean, San Francisco's like that too. So nasty going to the Tenderloin. I'm sorry, I'm just keeping it real. It's just janky. It's just, it feels like when you're walking in the street, it's like the streets are just kind of just melting. It only, the concrete don't even feel solid. It's just, it's just, just, it's just this. It's this, it's just this fog and this funk there, right? It just, it's just, it's not pleasant. It is not pleasant. That, but that's, that's, that's the earthly city. That's just that, that's just that feel you get. That's not this holy new Jerusalem. You see, the name Jerusalem gives its con continuity, uh, continuality, excuse me, if you will, with earth, especially with the place of our redemption. That's Jerusalem, what it is for us here on earth. But it's going to be the new Jerusalem in heaven, the new heaven. It is significant that this glorious dwelling place of God and his people is described as the holy city. The application is simply this. Cities are places where many people interact with one another. This isn't some isolated place, but it's a perfect community of believers with God. But it's interesting. When you think about it, we as the church are called to live like this now on earth. Now, I know it's not going to be perfect, but we are called to be a place that gathers for the Lord. And there should be community within the church. There should be that bond with believers. We shouldn't wait until we get to the holy city in the new heaven to experience that. We should be getting glimpses of that now as we live on this earth. An example of this. The Christian concept of heaven as a city, a place of life that's active, that have interests and people 
is very different from, let's say, the Hindu concept of a blank nirvana. You see, humans have never known a, com a community unmarred by sin. What I mean by this is Adam and Eve, they only knew it to a certain extent. They only knew community for a very little bit of time, and then the fall came. But in the New Jerusalem, there is something totally unique. It's going to be a sinless, pure community of righteousness. It's going to be a holy city. You see, problems, they do arise when I just said, you know, we, we can experience it now. But problems do arise when believers expect it to all be perfect here. You know, many times people leave churches. Why? Well, I don't like this. I don't like that. And this person said this. And this person did that. I mean, unless it's some kind of you know, heretical teaching going on or, you know, something crazy, right? And obviously the Holy, and you pray about it and the Holy Spirit leaves you, leads you to leave, then leave, you know? Uh, but if, if there's nothing wrong there and it's just people and people are flawed and someone's going to step on your toes and someone's going to rub you the wrong way and somebody in ministry is going to have a different opinion of what they think the money should go to, those kind of things are so trivial, we can't, we can't be bouncing out because of that. That's how you get church hoppers. They're going from church to church to church, never grow roots. Why? Because they're trying to find a perfect church. You're never going to find a perfect church this side of heaven because it doesn't exist. You got flawed men and women up in there, the spiritual hospital where everyone's sick, you know, <laughs> trying to get it together. So you're going to have issues. But this is where problems arise. People expect this this, this new heaven experience in the church now, and it just is not going to happen. So don't deceive yourself into believing that things are going to be perfect here because they're not. This city is not and can never be achieved by man. It's only a gift from God. That's why the scripture says the new heaven and the new earth come down from God. They come down from him, just like the Savior came down from God the Father, because it's only of him that it's made right. It's only in him that it's made righteous. Next we see prepared, the statement prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now here the apostle John used the most striking, beautiful imagery he could think of. The most beautiful thing a man will ever see is his bride coming down the aisle ready to meet him. John said that this is how beautiful the new Jerusalem will be, that it will be like a bride for for the groom. Okay, next we see the tabernacle of God is with men to dwell with them. Tabernacle, right? To dwell with. The tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. Going back to the Old Testament, Moses' tabernacle represented the dwelling place of God on the earth. It was the past representation of the dwelling place of God. This tabernacle of God is the reality of his presence. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. This is a beautiful thing. If you get nothing else out of this message, this right here, the fact that God will dwell with us, this expresses the essence of God's desire and man's purpose. God's desire is to be with you and to be with me. That's why he pursues you. That's why he pursues me. Even when we mess up really bad, he's like, I still love you. I still, I still want you to be in fellowship with me. He says, as far as the east is from the west, he chooses to separate and not look upon your sins. But he says, no, I have fellowship with you. I want fellowship with you. And, and, and that's our purpose. Our purpose is to have fellowship with God. So when we don't get in our word, when we don't pray, when, we don't, when we're not obedient to the things that God's calling us to do, we're, we're, we're messing up that relationship. And he's like, dude, I want you to fellowship with me. I want you to be with me. Don't you understand how, how joyful you'll be if you're in my word? How joyful you'll be if you follow my, my commandments and, and be obedient to what I call you to? You know, we're, we're searching for all this external stuff to give us happiness and joy. But the reality is, it only, the joy that we need only comes through fellowship with God. It only comes through right relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want to grow in that relationship every day. We, we need to be wise Christians and take account of where we're at, right? Don't let yourself go idle for months and just be like, well, I'm good. I'm good because I know I'm saved. I'm good because I attend church service regularly. It's like, no, we have to take account like, man, where am I at? That's what I was going through this past week. I was like, 
man, Lord, that sucks. I'm, I've kind of been slipping. I need, to get, I need to get right with you. But that's just the reality. That he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna correct us. He's going to discipline those he loves, right? And so don't take the discipline and the correction as, oh, man, here we go again. But it's like, okay, right? A loving father sees his son or his daughter kind of getting off track. And he's like, let me, let, me, let, me, let me get you back in place. And the more we're willing to be obedient, the less harsh it's going to have to be. But if, if we're hard headed, he's going to have to start clinking and knocking and it's going to be more painful than it needs to be. The application is this. God's desire is to live in close fellowship with man and women and man's purpose is to be a people unto God. This is the greatest joy of heaven and the ultimate restoration of what we lost at the fall with Adam and Eve is that fellowship. And ever since then, like I just said, man and women have been trying to fill that void with everything else but relationship with God. Adam's highest privilege was that he had companionship with the Most High God. Next, we see this phrase, the former things have passed away. God bless you. The new Jerusalem is distinguished by what it does not have. Okay? No more tears, no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain. Later, it will be shown that the new Jerusalem has no temple, no sacrifice, no sun, no moon, no darkness, no sin, no abomination. There's no need for sun or moon because Jesus Christ is the light and he will light up everything that needs to be lit. God will wipe away every tear from every eye. A lot of tears for a lot of different reasons. Tears of sympathy, tears of mercy, tears over sin, tears over persecution of the innocent, tears of disappointment, tears of neglect, tears of rejection. I could go on and on. Whatever the cause for your tears today being shed, they will all be dried up forever when that time comes. You won't have no use for no tear ducats no more. <laughs> Even tears of joy, there's going to be no need. You know, tears of joy are only because of we're, we're living in a fallen world. And, and, and it's just that passion welling up in you because uh, of, of the goodness of God. But see, apart from sin, there'll be no need for tears. It's a crazy emotion, right? You know, it, it's like, right, have you ever, I know you had, because we've all had it, where it's like, you're just so engaged with whatever's going on. Now, you can't even say nothing. You just, you're just crying. <laughs> you're just crying. That's the only way you can express yourself because words don't suffice. You're like, ah! Whether it's good or bad, you're just like, I'm so just enamored by what's going on that my emotions, I can't even talk about it. It just comes out in tears. But one day, that's all going to be wiped away and, and, and it's going to be a total different thing. I can't wait for that time. Oh, it's going to be... It's going to be nothing like we've ever seen. All right, verse 5. It says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He, all, he also, also he said, Excuse me, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He who sat on the throne said, Okay, this is an authoritative announcement coming from the throne of God itself. This is one of the few times in the book of Revelation where we clearly see God speaking directly from his throne. He says, behold, I make all things new. This statement is in the present tense. He says, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. Speaking of God, this is the consummation of God's work of renewal and redemption having begun here and now in our present time. Paul saw this transformative work on, the side, on this side of eternity. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 testifies to that. Paul said, so we do not lose hope, or excuse me, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For all of us that are growing older, everyone in here is growing older. <laughs> I don't care if you have no gray hair or not. This should be an encouragement. Don't lose heart. Your, your outer shell, yeah, okay, you know what I'm saying? Getting a little more grayer, it's getting a little more rickety when I walk, in a little harder to get up in the morning. But your inner man, your inner woman, your inner being is being renewed day by day in Christ Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's how you can be 80-something years old like a firecracker, ready to just pop off because you got that inner working of that renewing of your spirit, of your soul daily. And that's a beautiful thing. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All things are new. This statement. This is a brief glance at the thinking behind God's eternal plan to allow sin and its destruction in order to do a greater work for making all things new. If you think about your own life and you think of the sin that you've got yourself caught up in, had it not been for those sins, you wouldn't have come to know the Lord. That doesn't mean go and sin. Right? We are, the scripture always talks about, well, 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 what? I'm going to just go sin because of the Lord's mercy, mercy and grace? No. But sin helps us recognize our folly and our error if we're willing to see it for what it is. If we're willing to allow the Holy Spirit to witness to our spirit, then we're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm hecking wrong. <laughs> I'm messed up. Lord, help me, forgive me, right? But it's because of that. That now a good work, a greater work, and this is just like God's eternal plan. This is his eternal plan. This is just on a larger scale. But you look at your personal life, I can guarantee you, you can trace it back. And you're like, man, all that junk I got caught up in. Yeah, it was all that junk that actually did uh, wake me up because the Lord showed me. And I, I can't deny it. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be with the old Adam. I don't want to be with the old me. I was a horrible person. I want to be with the new Adam. He's making all things new. At this point in his plan of the ages, the plan is complete. All things are new. Don't miss this. The application is this, okay? Our instinct as humans, we romanticize about our innocent state, wishing that Adam had never sinned, right? We all say, oh, you know, if I was there, I wouldn't have did it. It doesn't matter who it was, we would have all sinned. We would have all fallen short. We would have all fell. You know, it doesn't matter what Eve did. It doesn't matter what Adam did. We would have all done the same thing. It's just, it's just that free will, that free will. It's like the little child. You tell him, don't touch that stove. You're going to burn your hand. <laughs> I forgive you, but see, you've got to learn because you had the free will. You were tantalized. You just, because I, I told you no, gave you all the more reason to do it. Because you just thought, well, hmm, and then you burn. And, and this is what happened with, with Adam and Eve. You see, but we fail to realize that redeemed man is greater than innocent man. Because what we gain, we gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. Don't forget that. What we gain in Christ is so much more than what we lost in Adam. God's perfect state is one of redemption, not of innocence. See, and that's why it's like you can come as a wretched mess. I could come before you and be like, you know what? Yeah, my week was kind of tough. But you know what, man? Praise God that it's his redemption and not my innocence. He's like, keep him, get up, dude. I'm cleaning you up. Get up. <laughs> and that's how he does with us. But we have to trust that it's his redemptive work. So many times Christians are like, I'm going to clean myself up. I'm going to do. I'm going to do. And it's like, he's like, no, nah, man, half the things he's like, I didn't even call you to do. And that's what the Bible talks about. Some of those works are going to burn up because he's like, I didn't call you to do that. You just took it upon yourself. You just created this responsibility for yourself and thinking that this is what I wanted you to do. And he's like, dude, I want you to focus on your stinking family, bro. Focus on those that are closest to you. Love on them. Raise them up the right way. Quit trying to do all this in the community when you ain't even got it right with your home. I don't know. I'm speaking to somebody today. That's so real. I know the Lord's speaking to me about stuff like that. When God finally, finally completes this work of making all things new, they will stay new. And this is something beyond my mind. I can't understand it. I can't explain it. It's not going to get dusty. No dead skin cells that you're going <laughs> to have to swiffer off, right? It's going to stay new. It's going to stay fresh. It's not going to tarnish. It's not going to wither. There's going to be no more gray, saggy, droopy. No, it's going to be fresh, vibrant, strong, bah, vital, you know, healthy forever. And he says, right, these words are truthful and faithful. John was probably so astounded. He was probably so blown away that what he was seeing that he would have forgot. And so the Lord had to remind him, write these words down. <laughs> write them down, man, so these believers can know they can trust in what I'm telling, showing you is the truth. All right, we're going to end with these last two verses. Six and eight, he says, 
And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's not excluding women. I just always have to make that disclaimer. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars... That's like liars, perpetual liars that don't stop lying, that live a lifestyle of lying. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay, it is done. God's eternal purpose in Jesus Christ is now accomplished. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 tells us, As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. That means all believers, all of them, all of them. Everybody, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you did. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, a true follower, he's coming. All those people are coming together. At this point, all things have been resolved or summed up in Jesus. It is done. Next, we see this statement. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Remember what Jesus Christ called himself in John 7, chapter 37 and 38, or what he said about himself, excuse me. He says on the, it says, on the last day of the feast, the great, the, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So if we're thirsty, we need to go to the Lord. If we're, if we're parched, right, because... Drinking and thirst are, are common pictures of God's supply of man of, of, uh, and man's spiritual need. Drinking is an action, but it is an action of receiving. Like faith, is, like faith it is doing something, but not merit-based. It, it's not work-based. Think about this. What does a thirsty person do to rid their thirst? They drink, right? They drink. They don't drink Coca-Cola. They drink water. They don't drink something that's going to make them thirstier. They drink water. And this example spiritually, to drink is to receive, to take in the refreshing living water who is Jesus Christ. But notice he says, drink freely without payment. It's free to you and me. It costs us absolutely nothing. I mean, if anything, it costs us time, right? And I think that's, that's the biggest thing. So that's the biggest distraction for many people. They don't want to part with their time. Just be honest. We all at times don't want to part with our time. But in order to have that living water, we have to invest our time in him. And then we will be refreshed. This means we have nothing to lose but everything to gain. He paid the price, but we need to accept the gift in order to reap the reward. And he who overcomes shall inherit all things. That's the next statement we see as I begin to close. Those who overcome enjoy a special relationship with him. That's why it says, I will be his God and he shall be my son. Basically, they will be my people. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 5 says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God? See, so in Christ, you overcome the world, but it's because your faith and your belief in him and him alone. And as I, I end with this last uh, note, as uh, Michelle and Isaiah come up, it says, this is the other side of it. This is the not happy side. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, they all have their part in the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. Those who reject Jesus and make themselves apostate are specifically prohibited from entering into the new Jerusalem. Notice it's those who make themselves. God didn't make them this way. They choose to still walk in their willful disobedience, their free will disobedient choice, the cowardly. The new Jerusalem is the eternal home of believers, but unbelievers must spend eternity in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur. Unbelievers are identified in this verse as cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. You see, cowardly unbelievers fear for various reasons. But I look at our culture because that's where I'm at. I'm not in Africa. I'm not in Asia. I'm not in South America. I'm not in Belgium. I'm not in Antarctica. I'm here in North America. This is what I see in our culture usually. Many fear that they might lose their possessions 
They might lose their jobs, they might lose their friends, or they might lose their comfortability in this life if they trust in Jesus Christ. And that's what holds so many people back. They don't want to be outcasted. They don't want to lose the connections they have. So they forego eternal life with him to hold on to what they can keep. It reminds me of the rich young ruler. He kept every commandment. And then Jesus said, take all you have and sell it to the poor and come follow me. But because he was so entrenched in what he had, what he had accumulated, what he had worked so hard for, he couldn't give it up. And he walked away, the Bible says, bitterly. He cried bitterly. Those are hard tears. That's like when Peter denied Christ. He, 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 he was bitter. He, he was hurt because he's like, man, I can't let go. That should not be said of us today. But as Jesus taught in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, it is worthless to gain the whole world but lose your soul. What's the most important thing that you have? It's not your possessions. It's your soul. Your soul is what's so important. Keep your soul with Christ. May your, your insurance be with him. That way when things go down, you don't have to fret. You don't have to worry. You're accounted for. You see, other sinners here are identified as those who murder. They cater to sexual lust. They lack moral character. They practice black magic or deal in illegal drugs. So they worship false God and lies. We see this going on all around us in our society. So it is so real. These people as well will experience the second death, which is eternal suffering in the lake of fire. Their refusal to trust in Jesus Christ has imprisoned them in their own sins. So do you see, church? It always stands. You can choose life or you can choose death. Today, choose life. The key is Christ. He unlocks the code for you to have newness and newness of life. He's the one that can break every bond, every chain as that song says, will break because Christ has broken it. When he went to Hades, he took death, he took the key, he broke everything, and he, he said, no, I've, I've, I've lived and I survived it. May we be those who choose a life and not death, and may we share that life with those around us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just thank you for the fact that you give freely. It costs you everything, Lord, but you give because you desire to have fellowship with us. May we not take it lightly. May it be the number one concern of our life to have true intimate fellowship with you. And when we start to get off track, may you correct us, Lord. May we be those that are wise to heed the warnings so we don't have to go through unnecessary hardship to get right back in a relationship with you that's unhindered by sin. Father, I thank you. Give your people wisdom. Give them love. Give them mercy. Give them grace. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.